Mami Taco Yepi. I'm Anka Elvotaine. I'm just going to talk a little bit today about some of the physical objects that I use in teaching because I've been asked to explain why I use so much stuff in teaching. And I know teachers are partial to stuff, but I'm actually super, super thoughtful about the design of my stuff. And I use stuff that you might think is for kids, uh, even when I'm working with adult learners, because it's very strategic. So I'm going to start by talking about these dolls. These are dolls of Lakota, Dakota people that have been made by a member of the Lakota Nation, Diane tells his name, who has a lovely shop on Etsy, um, and actually worked with me to custom order these dolls. And they, um, they are a, a male doll and a female doll. And um, there's very key reasons why I wanted the dolls and why I wanted them to look this certain way for working with the Dakota language. So obviously I wanted some money to go to a member of the Dakota Nation, but also they have to kind of be designed in a certain way. So with a lot of languages, you, um, you'll see teachers using a signal about long hair um, to like something like this or like this to indicate that something has to do with females. That isn't appropriate in Dakota culture because as you can see from these dolls, um, both men and women, traditionally can have long hair. And so um, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and also, um, there is a lot more meaning to hair that in the Dakota culture. So it's not something that we want to use as a gender signifier because it actually has its own meaning that people at a more advanced level can learn about. Um, the clothing, however, is a really good way to distinguish. Um, so um, Diane tells his name has designed this male doll to have um, a belt. So this is a sort of a ribbon in this case, but there's a lot of different materials that belts could be made out of in the real world. And so this belt runs around the waist. So that is a signal of male dress. And you'll notice that the woman is wearing a ribbon dress. Um, a lot of communities also use ribbon skirts. And you'll see that there's multiple ribbons and that is very um, typical or signifying of females. And so, um, I use those distinctions to develop gestures that help students know when we're talking about men and when we're talking about women. So the gestures look like this. Wichashta. Wea. Wea. Wichashta. Wea. Wichashta. Wea. And so they learn that this is Wichashta and this is Wea. And that's extra important for the Dakota language because words are used differently by wichasha and by wion. So we don't want men to use a woman's word and we don't want women to, use a, women to use a man's word. So it's important to have those signals from day one to teach them the different ways that they're expected to speak based on that gender binary. There is of course more to it, it's much more complicated, but we use that with um, beginners. I also wanna say that <laughs> Diane was able to make these little babies which, um, <clears throat> of course, help us to teach the word baby <laughs> um, in the beginning level. What is really great about there being two is that specifically in the Dakota language, the um, verbs, um, and, and most things are verbs, <laughs> um, are different for multiple animate objects. So humans are animate. And so it's very helpful to have two and not only just one because a lot of things you will say differently. For example, you will say she has a baby differently. The verb will be the verb to have will be different when she has babies. So, um, hokshiopa yuhe, hokshiopa wicha yuhe. So it's very helpful that there are multiple babies. Specific to the language. Now, there are some tools that I use that are not specific to the language and I use them because they lower the effective filter and they're fun. Um, I have to think ahead of time about how easy they will be to pronounce and I don't want to break any taboos, but there could still just be things that are fun. So this was a sloth, <laughs> a stuffed sloth that I found and I just thought it was super fun to have as a co-teacher and to use. And of course he has a personality, which is that he is slow and lazy. So he'll be fun to make fun of during the course and to talk to. And so I've named him Shkangapi. 
Shkangapim means sloth like or doesn't like to do much, doesn't really want to move around. Shkangapim. Shkangapim. And that also gives the learners a chance to try out those un unfamiliar sounds early on because they'll want to know his name. Shkangapi. Going back to culturally appropriate tools, however, I searched far and wide and I actually found this um, stuffed spider <laughs> who is cute and not scary and that's good. Um, in the town of Evian, France, uh, it's made by uh, a brand from the UK called Jelly Cat, but I, I didn't find it until I was in this um, relatively small city in France. And he's very cute and lovable. Um, but he's a spider, Unktomi. Unktomi is very important in Dakota culture. He's a trickster. He does different things. He's not necessarily evil or scary. Um, he does different things, but he um, teaches lessons sometimes by doing tricks, by um, making people mess up. And so he's a great one to blame for our linguistic mistakes with our learners. And so um, from the beginning, we learn about Unktomi. And it also creates a lot of laughter as we find out who finds Unktomi to be cute and says, Unktomi watching, Unktomi watching, I want Unktomi. <laughs> and who says, Ooh, Unktomi watching shni. And of course, the reason that it was so hard for me to find Unktomi is that spiders, of course, in European culture are considered dirty, scary, evil, bad, not cute, not cuddly, not funny, um, not clever. And so um, they don't make a lot of plush toys for them, um, but they're not stigmatized in the same way in Dakota culture. And so he's a fun one to have around. And of course, people like to physically touch him when I can teach my classes when I'm physically present. But when I'm not physically present, I've also still tried to incorporate objects that give a tactile experience, a non-linguistic experience, because I'll tell you what, Nobody ever forgets the names <laughs> of these <laughs> stuffed animals that we use. Um, they get really attached to them. And so that's also why it's important to give them a name that's a thoughtful name and not name them, you know, George or something. Um, but a name that linguistically helps the students. Um, so Unktomi is a big hit, that he's very cute and soft and plush. There are some tools that I will be using because of teaching online during these COVID days and into the future. And so one of them is that I'm no longer teaching my students out in the woods on the ground. <laughs> so I can't pound on the ground and say, maka, maka. I can't do that. Um, and it's kind of hard when you're sitting in your, <laughs> in your um, bedroom made to look like an office to indicate maka. So um, I have chosen this, um, it's actually a Christmas ornament that is a, light, a globe. And so that is makaki, maka. And that's a very important word and concept with Dakota culture, so I will introduce it early on. Um, and I will have something that's very clear what it is and that I can show, even though they will, of course, then have pictures of it and experience it in 2D. But the students will also, and uh, maybe this is a little bit of an advertisement if you sign up for my course, <laughs> when I have a big enough cohort to run um, a live class with multiple students, I have also invested in some gifts for them. And these are very carefully chosen gifts. So they are again um, plushy and fun. They're little tiny ones and they're handmade. Um, again, I got them on Etsy, although I was not able to find these from a native person. That's a goal in the future. Um, but this is, for example, Mato. Mato. So this is the, um, the bear and that is culturally relevant. And so I chose woodland animals that are culturally relevant. You have your beaver, you have your bat, <laughs> bat, you have a cute little skunk. I also have a leaf, a tree, a bird, um, a squirrel. So all relevant to Dakota Makoche, so the, the culture that we will be learning about. Um, and all kind of cute and fun and plushy. And they're just little cheap ones, but I will be mailing them out to the students so they will be able to physically interact with these and they will learn each one's name. And I can promise you, they will never forget the name of the one they get in the mail. So there will be an emotional and a tactile attachment to these. And that also gives us known words that will be really easy for them to remember because they will have, they will know mato instantly. <laughs> um, and then I can use mato in all kinds of different grammatical formations. So I, I teach using construction grammar and I can 
throw my toe into all different kinds of scenarios and they will recognize that word. And so it will make many, many more phrases recognizable to them while also having a certain cultural relevance and a familiarity to them. So there are certain things that are culturally relevant that may not be familiar to the students, particularly these students are largely going to be coming from um, European uh, cultures, um, either in Europe or in North and South America. I also work with some people in the Middle East who have gone to European style schools. So they recognize a lot of signs and signals and gestures from European culture. And so I integrate some of those, but never in a way that breaks Dakota taboos. And then I try to incorporate some knowledge about Dakota culture in a way that allows them to grasp it quickly um, and, and to familiarize themselves with some cultural basics without demanding that they be able to do so with really complex linguistic forms of the language because these are gonna be for my total beginners. But even the ones who start out as total beginners and they remember this signal as weah, weah, woman, they are going to be able to use their language in the intermediate and advanced classes to talk about ribbon dresses and ribbon skirts and what they mean. And they will already have encountered that even if they've never actually encountered a Dakota person. So there's a, a lot of different factors. And of course, I also try to choose the most relevant and um, attainable, so pronounceable or understandable, uh, memorable uh, vocabulary for these. Um, so again, I don't give them random names, cutesy names. I give them names that are relevant in the language that actually help people learn languages. And we start out with we and we chashta, which are general terms for man and woman, even though in the context of this set of dolls, they are clearly also ina and ate. So they are also a mother and a father and together they form Atiwahe. Um, we'll get to that, but first they learn the most general term that they can use with each other and that they can use to ask me questions about the language. So they can ask me from day one, is this a man's way of speaking or a woman's way of speaking using we and we chashta. So ate, ina, tiwahe, mother, father, family. Those words will come later based on the same characters and the knowledge that they already have of them. Um, so I'm creating a hybrid between how I do things in person, how I do things online, and I hope that it will be as effective online as it has been in person. I can tell you that I have students whose first language is Spanish, second language is Western Armenian, who live in Argentina, who took 20 lessons of Dakota with me one year ago. Before taking those lessons, they did not know that Dakota was a language, they'd never heard of it. And they've never been exposed to it since because they don't have any idea how they could expose themselves living in Argentina to a critically endangered language of the upper Midwest. And they can send me one and two minute voicemails even now that are entirely in Dakota and I can understand them perfectly. So the courses are that effective and they remember these, these characters really well because of that effective filter effect, which is that they're having fun they're having a lived tactile experience and it implants on them with positive emotions. So it's very effective. I hope this is helpful to you in your practice.